Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. Rebecca Thoman with Compassion and Choices, and we are going to wait just a couple minutes to allow more people to enter the webinar. So thanks for being with us and hold tight. We'll be starting in just a minute. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Dr. Rebecca Thoman. We are waiting just a couple minutes to allow folks to enter the webinar and we will get started in just a couple minutes. So hold tight, thanks. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Dr. Rebecca Thoman, and I'll be leading our uh, discussion this evening, but we are gonna give just another minute to allow more people to sign into the webinar, and then we will get started. People are saying hi in the chat. I encourage that. Feel free to use the chat throughout this evening. I'm gonna wait maybe another half a minute and then we will get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for being with us. My name is Dr. Rebecca Thoman, and I will be with you this evening for our summer reading series first book, The Song of Our Scars, The Untold Story of Pain, with Dr. Heder Bereich. Just to remind everybody that you are muted and your video is off, please submit questions in the Q&A box we do have the chat enabled, feel free to chat. I'll try to monitor the chat for questions, but um, using the box is probably easier for me. So if you have a good question for Dr. Varaich, please put it there. Um, this webinar is being recorded and uh, we have enabled the live transcription process. And as you can see, we have Teddy with us this evening as our ASL interpreter. Just to let everyone, we do have some new people with us to let you all know that Compassion and Choices is the nation's largest and oldest nonprofit committed to improving care, expanding options, and empowering everyone to chart their end of life journey. We work in many areas, and I encourage you to take a look at our website, compassionandchoices.org, to see all that we do in the realm of education, advocacy, legal, uh, we have a legal department, we're very busy. So without going into that, I'm just going to encourage you to check out our website. Doctors for Dignity is an initiative of Compassion and Choices. I direct that program. We're a community of physicians from around the country who are united in our support for access to a full range of end-of-life options, including medical aid in dying, and we're committed to reducing end-of-life disparities. I'm really thrilled to have with us this evening, Dr. Heder Bereich, who is a former board member of Compassion and Choices. Heder completed internal medicine and cardiology training at Harvard Medical School at Duke University and is the Associate Director of Heart Failure at the, v at the VA Boston Healthcare System. He is an Associate Physician at Brigham and Wild Women's Hospital and assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. He writes frequently for the New York Times and the Washington Post, and has also written for the Atlantic, 
The Wall Street Journal, The LA Times, The Guardian, Vox, Slate, The Boston Globe, and Stat News. So <clears throat> he gets around. He has more than 120 peer-reviewed research papers, including multiple papers published in the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of the American Medical Association. Hedder served on the Board of Compassion and Choices from 2018 to 2020, and is the author of several books, including Modern Death, How Medicine Changed the End of Life, and State of the Heart, Exploring the History, Science, and Future of Cardiac Disease. So I hope many of you had the opportunity to obtain and read or listen to audio tape of Hedder's new book, the Song of Our Scars, The Untold Story of Pain. If you've not yet obtained that, you'll be able to get it through the Hachette Book Basic Books website, or I'm sure it's available on Amazon. And I may ask Heather to tell us a few more places that folks can get the book if you haven't had the chance. If you have had the chance to read it, I really welcome your questions. And if you've not had the chance, I think you'll be motivated to go get the book after our discussion this evening. <clears throat> Heather, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Rebecca, uh, and uh, the entire Compassion and Choices community uh, for, for joining on uh, for this webinar. So I'm just going to uh, launch right in. And um, I just pulled out a few things that I found really interesting in the book that I thought we could start for the conversation. And I know others are going to have um, comments and questions as well. but. In chapter one, just right at the beginning, you define pain on a spectrum of overlapping phenomena with the pure physical sensation on one end, suffering on the other, and pain in between. Can you talk more about that continuum and those distinctions? Absolutely. Um... I, I think pain is a... Uh, there, there, there are many things in medicine that uh, can be quite technical, can be within sort of the purview of a very specialized field, but pain is probably the most uh, democratic uh, and ubiquitous sensation that we all deal with. Pain is the most common reason why uh, someone comes to the hospital, comes and seeks medical care. Uh, it's probably our most ancient ailment. It's a reason why medicine exists in many ways, is because uh, people look to us to alleviate their pain, uh, but also their suffering. Because I was writing a book on pain and because pain is used in so many different contexts and because also our understanding or view of pain has changed so much over time, I wanted to start off initially by just you know, defining some specific terms to sort of share what, what exactly we talk about when we talk about pain, specifically with regards to this book. Uh, one of the things that I feel strongly is that even though for many other things, our, uh, our advance, our, our understanding of so many phenomena that uh, pertain to health and well-being and illness has have, have advanced, pain is one of those things where I, I feel like in many ways our understanding has actually regressed. Uh, and many people have today come to view of pain as being a purely physical sensation, as something that just happens only in our body. Uh, and that is just tr tr transmitted directly to our brains where we experience it. Uh, but actually, that's not really entirely true. Uh, if you look at the, if you look, if you understand pain from a scientific perspective, but also if you're someone who lives with pain or who or takes care of someone with pain, uh, what becomes clear is that pain is part. Of pain, pain is as much a physical sensation as much as an emotion that our brain feels. Uh, before pain, the precursor to pain. Uh, is uh, often this uh, sensation called nociception. Nociception is essentially the process that starts when, say, you're pricked in the shoulder with a pin, and these nerve signals go up your up your uh, up your body, up your spine to your brain, uh, that then generate this experience of pain. Nociception itself is a purely physical sensation, but it is subconscious. But it is in the brain. It is this transformation of nociception into pain that happens all in the brain uh, that leads to why we hurt. And then you have this third phenomenon called suffering, which, which is almost the, you know, what I might call the interpretation of pain, the interpretation of our woes. Suffering has also been defined in many, many different ways. Uh, it has been defined as anything that threatens the intactness of someone's personhood, 
that can be something that's purely that can be some form of physical pain and an ailment of any sort. Uh, and so I think the way to think about these three phenomena is you have pain in the middle, which is as much a physical sensation, as much an emotion, as much as, as a traumatic memory that all come together uh, to create this, uh, to create what we feel when we're in agony with no on one end, which is a purely physical but subconscious construct and suffering, which is essentially our interpretation of pain. And I found that this was a good way for me to think about how to differentiate these three. Uh, certainly you can have pain without nociception. People have phantom limb pain decades after maybe they've had an amputation in which even though there's no signals coming from above, they can still experience that very pain. But you can also have nociception without pain. Think about what happens when you are under anesthesia or if you have a runner who is running a marathon, they may have a lot of nociception, but they may not have any pain, they may not have any suffering. But most of the times when we have, when I am seeing patients, or when we experience uh, something like this, we're experiencing all of those three things combined. So what, what influences how we interpret pain? How does pain turn into suffering? What are the factors that have an impact on that? Yep. So one of the reasons I wrote this book uh, was because when I was in medical school, I had this really terrible injury. I was lifting weights. And then before I knew it, I was I, I heard this loud click in my back and I found myself uh, trapped under all this weight. I was rescued at that moment by many other medical students who were around. I was taken to the emergency room and before this pain had been a transient visitor in my life, but it was after this injury that pain really became a permanent part of my life. Um, and you would think that what transforms uh, acute pain into chronic pain is the extent or the severity of the initial injury. Uh, but that, but actually that's not true. Uh, even injuries that may not be very severe to begin with might transform into chronic pain. Uh, I, when I was injured, I had this MRI performed and the MRI showed all these different abnormalities uh, that sounded quite concerning and disturbing, uh, both to me, but also to the radiologist. But the fact is that those abnormalities, in fact, studies have shown can happen in people who have no pain at all. In fact, they're fairly common, even in young people, even though they get older as you age, things like de de degenerated discs or, or prolapsed discs. I mean, all the sort of things that you might have heard about if you or if, you, uh, if you've had back pain yourself or live with, with someone with back pain. But none of those abnormalities seem to have any association with how much pain someone has or whether their pain turns from acute into chronic pain. And the, the, so, so you might wonder, well, what does cause that form of transformation? Well, first of all, we are all unique and we're all different and all of us have this individual and uh, uh, personal journey that we live with pain. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that pain is so complex that so many different factors come into play when it comes to explaining this transformation. I'll give you one small example, just giving you a sense of just how complex pain can be. One of the biggest, one of the most important factors that determines who goes on to develop chronic pain is actually if someone has had any type of adverse childhood experience growing up. If you've grown up in a home that was dominated by violence, if you had a broken home, if you were abandoned, if you if you were witness to violent crimes when you were growing up, all of those factors can leave this imprint inside you, inside your bodies, inside your memories that can actually cause or catalyze this transformation of acute into chronic pain because, you know, in part, maybe our, our, we, are, we are so vigilant and paranoid of all sorts of threats in and around us. And so <clears throat> as much as the physical injury itself determines who develops acute into chronic pain. It is also all these other factors that come into play when it, when it comes to uh, determining whose pain becomes prolonged and whose pain goes away. And it's not just something that can be understood if you look from a pure sort of biological perspective, you need to have a very holistic view to really understand pain. So you talk a little bit about, you mentioned how pain is one of the the leading reasons that people come to see physicians. Um, and so given what you said, I'm interested in, um, <clears throat> you know, you do talk about the medical system in your book quite a bit. And I have a, a quote that I like, which is that you say, medicine does little to quote, address the multidimensional aspects of what it means to hurt. 
how is that manifest in physicians practicing medicine, particularly um, in managing pain and understanding suffering? Yep. I think that what, what's clear is that over the last few hundred years, that we have seen the sort of advancements in medicine that we've never seen in the history of humanity, in the history of science. Uh, even in the midst of a pandemic, we were able to develop life-saving vaccines, uh, the sort of which we've never never seen before in therapeutics, et cetera. Uh, in my own sort of field of heart disease, you know, having a heart attack used to be a death sentence, and now it's something that you can you know, get a procedure for and be out and about the very next day. And yet when it comes to pain, it seems like we're still struggling to help people in pain. Uh, and the health system is as much at fault as anyone else. One of the big mistakes that we've made with pain is that we've tried to, pain is a very complex phenomenon and we've tried to simplify it in medicine. One of the ways that we tried to simplify it was to essentially uh, treat it like it was a purely sort of physical sensation or physical construct, similar to uh, how fast your heart rate is or how high your blood pressure is. In fact, the name of this movement was uh, pain is a fifth vital sign movement. And part of it was coming from a place of kindness and compassion, because before this, people are not paying a lot of attention to pain. People could be suffering and be in physical agony, and yet they, their pain would not be addressed. And so there was a sense that we need to do more to be able to highlight the fact that people are having uncontrolled pain. And yet, because our tools were so simple and our approach was so simple, and we wanted to take something so complex and simplify it to our tools, which are essentially procedures or pills, uh, we ended up doing a disservice and taking a step back. One of the other reasons why our health system is so, uh, is so poor at treating, especially chronic pain, is because we have become so uh, used, spoiled, uh, with things like uh, imaging tests like CAT scans or x-rays or blood tests. We, we're so used to being able to visualize disease, visualize abnormalities that, uh, so for example, if I'm, if I'm a cardiologist, if I have someone coming in with chest pain, I can get so many different tests that can tell me immediately if what the person is having is something that is severe, that might need a urgent procedure or surgery, or whether it is something that I can reassure them and tell them that even though your pain is distressing, there's no evidence of damage to your heart. But when it comes to most patients with chronic pain, most patients who have chronic conditions that cause chronic pain, we don't have those sort of tests. We don't have, so for example, if you're having chronic back pain and now today your back pain is worse than yesterday. Yes, there are a few ways we can figure out whether you have had some type of new injury, but for the most part, we don't have any type of blood test or imaging test to, to give us a sense for what is different about the pain today versus not. And medicine usually struggles with these types of invisible illnesses. In fact, many people who have these illnesses, which don't conform to these usual rules of medicine, their, their suffering can be not taken seriously or delegitimized, or they might even be called, um, you know, people who are essentially, uh, you know, what, what, what the, the pain seeking patient, which is essentially code for saying that, oh, this person is only play acting so that they can get some type of drugs. And so, and the last thing that uh, the reason why our understanding of pain has been so poor is because medicine has allowed itself to be infiltrated by all these different corporate uh, influences. We all know about, uh, or many of us know about the opioid epidemic, which is now killing more than 100,000 people a year. Um, and we understand that, you know, there was a time that, that because of the influence of these uh, pharmaceutical companies, Physicians change their practice and overprescribe opioids to many people who didn't need them. Many people who would have otherwise done fine. Uh, but that type of but but what it, what gets less attention is how those the, how those corporations also change their very understanding of pain. How they infiltrated our educational systems. How they infiltrated our drug approval systems, etc. And really, that that they they have had they've left this long legacy of corruption and lies that we are still trying to combat. So there are many, many, many different reasons why pain is still is so poorly treat, understood and also poorly treated by the health system. Uh, but I am hopeful that we can overcome that. But it's, it's hard to do that without being an advocate for yourself, knowing the facts and being an educated person. Here in Minneapolis, one of our major health systems um, is affiliated with the Penny George Center for Health and Healing, hmm. which is really focused on alternative, Mm -hmm. or complementary medicine. 
Um, what do you know about the effectiveness and or the acceptance of integrating some of these other uh, techniques into chronic pain treatment? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think as far as pain is concerned, I think the the one, if, if you can take away one thing that I've learned is that there's no silver bullet for pain and that what works for one patient for in pain might not work for another. Uh, so if you're, if you're someone who is in pain or wants to seek better care for pain or has a loved one who is in pain, I would suggest keep an open mind. Uh, you, you never know what's going to work for you. Um, you know, as far as as far as alternative or complementary medicine is concerned, you know, I, I think I'm always I, you know, especially before this book, I would say that I was a bit wary of all many of these terms. I feel like many people use these terms to change the evidence bar for, you know, getting treatments to patients. But one of the things that's clear about pain is that we actually have a lot of treatments that might be called considered alternative forms of therapy that can be quite effective. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things that I am a big advocate for with regards to pain is interdisciplinary pain management, which essentially means that seeking that 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 that, that people receive care not just by one individual or by one surgeon or by one pain physician, but really by a team that evaluates the patient, figures out why they're in pain, and then is able to offer a host of different therapies that might work for the patient. So one of the therapies that I think is very, very effective for pain that I don't think we use enough of is exercise. Now, I know many people in pain dread exercise and dread that word because many times what happens when, when you have chronic pain and you exercise? your pain gets worse. That's what happened to me when I had to start physical therapy. I could barely do the exercises because it just hurt so much. But when it done in a supervised fashion, and once, you've, once, you're, once your body starts getting used to the exercises, it can really be extremely effective. And that's exactly what the research suggests, is that even though patients can have pain initially, over a long period of time, exercise can be quite effective. But there are other forms of therapy that can be very effective too. One of those is hypnosis. Now, you know, many of you might hear about hypnosis and you might think of it as some form of uh, stage trick or a circus trick. But the fact of the matter is that hypnosis for patients who can be hypnotized, not everyone is hypnotizable, but for those who are hypnotizable, even self-hypnosis can be very, very effective in helping people live better with pain. And then the last uh, sort of broad form of therapy that, I'm, uh, that I am a, I'm a big advocate for uh, is actually cognitive uh, therapies, such as uh, so cognitive behavioral therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy or pain reprocessing therapy. Uh, essentially what these therapies do is that they take away the fear that we associated with pain. Now, when you have an acute injury, it's very, very important for you to react to that injury immediately because you want to make sure that everything is okay that your body is safe and that your body isn't under any form of mortal threat but in patients who have chronic pain many times the pain might be as severe and our reaction is the same even though uh, that can be quite exhausting you cannot keep having that same type of reaction and one of the things that happens is that that reaction itself the attention that pain creates or generates actually increases how much we hurt. So pain is one of those things that the more you try to control it, the more powerful it becomes. And many of these therapies, what they do is they try to change people's focus away from focusing on the pain to focusing on their lives and living their lives to the fullest, even if it hurts. You go to the birthday that birthday party, even if you are unsure about the car ride there that it might hurt or, the, or that you might not feel like you're fitting in because you're uncomfortable and others are not. Uh, because in the end, it is those forms of therapy that provide durable relief for many, many patients, and the evidence base for those is quite strong. So just to circle back, I, I do think that having a holistic and multidisciplinary approach towards pain is really is the essential. And, and even though for many patients, they might receive uh, relief from procedures and pills, there's a host of other therapies that we should never close the door to because for many, many patients, those can be even more effective than traditional therapies. Sorry, this is a great segue to um, 
jumping forward to chapter six of your book, uh, you know, when you talk about an interdisciplinary approach to pain management, that's sort of the definition of hospice care. Mm -hmm. And you talk a little bit about Cicely Saunders, who was the founder of the hospice movement in this country. And it was really revolutionary for her to come up with the concept of total pain. Mm -hmm. which includes the psychological, the emotional, the spiritual, interpersonal suffering. And that she revolutionized end of life care by calling for patients to be treated liberally, addressing their pain through um, different, different approaches, addressing their spiritual pain. Can you talk a little bit more about just her contribution and yeah. how that end of life concept of pain and suffering fits with some of your uh, what you're talking about with chronic pain. Absolutely. So uh, Cecily Saunders is, you know, one of my personal heroes. She was uh, born in the UK to a very affluent family. And ever since she was a young child, wanted to be a nurse. Uh, and her parents thought that it was, you know, beneath her station to pursue nursing and would, uh, would rebuff her efforts until the Second World War broke out. And then they had no choice. And she essentially ran off to become a nurse. Uh, it was during her time as a nurse when she saw that there were so many patients who had terminal illnesses like metastatic cancer, et cetera, who were essentially whose pain was not attended to in any way whatsoever. Uh, and so she, but because she was a nurse and this was a traditional British medical system and no one really paid a lot of attention to her, she actually then went to medical school, became a physician. Uh, but never forgot what why she was in medicine to begin with and after finishing her medical school uh, joined this cancer ward and really started to perfect uh, her own per approach towards uh, the terminally ill patient uh, in pain and this was at a time when um, opioids were really sort of considered taboo in medicine and no one would receive any sort of sort of pain relief because People are so afraid uh, of uh, the addictive potential and side effects. Uh, but she helped to overcome that taboo, especially for patients with not, with, who had uh, a terminal illness such as cancer, et cetera, and founded the hospice movement and helped revolutionize how we view care, uh, how we, and, and, and brought this idea or concept of total pain, uh, which isn't just a physical phenomenon, but really pulls in all these different sources of existential angst and distress that cause us to suffer at the end of life. You know, for her, um, opioids were just one way to provide compassion for patients. And that was a tool that she had. But really, I think what she did was that medicine had veered too far off away from patients. It was not patient-centered at all. It only catered to the whims and, and, and rituals of physicians and nurses and the medical establishment, and she helped to bring the patient back into the center of the argument. Now, her mission, however, was also um, uh, in some ways used by corporate uh, powers. So at the, at this, this is at the same point where, uh, you know, even though now it had become acceptable to treat pain relief in people who had terminal illnesses, what the corporate companies wanted to do now was to expand this mission to really anyone who was having pain, even though whether those medicines actually work for people who had back pain or headaches or neck pain, et cetera, was not there. And I think that's really where this, we, we, we went overboard and we didn't do the type, type necessary research needed to make sure that what we were doing was in fact, not just safe, but actually effective as well. Um, but um, I think we all, all of us uh, uh, owe a lot to Cecily Saunders for changing the culture of medicine, for making medicine for really helping medicine reconnect with its heart and soul, which is really taking care of the pe person in pain, um, uh, especially someone who had a terminal illness. So um, her legacy lives on and I hope will continue to live on as well. It, it's almost a little uh, paradoxical that we have a problem with over prescribing medication for pain, but at the end of life, there's often reluctance in hospice workers to give too much uh, medication and how, how do you make sense of that? There, there's so many paradoxes in our healthcare system. I mean, we had just talked about complementary medicine and, and the role for exercise and therapy and hypnosis, et cetera. And you know, for many patients, these can be hard to access. Many patients are, are, don't, may not live close to a center that provides these resources, but at the same time, 
Uh, there's so many aspects in our health system in which we're probably doing way more than what we need to do. I mean, uh, you know, a pain physician I spoke to said that it's easier for her to book someone's third or fourth uh, back surgery than it is to actually get them therapy. Uh, you know, the amount of procedures that we do that don't have a lot of great evidence, the amount of surgeries that we do that uh, actually the, the rate of failure is extremely high. Uh, we spend a lot of money in places that we probably shouldn't be spending money on and don't spend enough money in places that we should. Hospice is one great example where I think that I think the more resources we can provide a hospice, I think the better uh, everyone does, most particularly patients. And we are seeing the same thing with pain as well, where <clears throat> there are so many settings in which uh, pain is not fully addressed. This is especially true if you have some type of disadvantage to begin with. If you're a, if you're a woman, uh, if you're a minority, if you're a person of color, if you're Black American, um, if you're poor, uh, the chances that your pain is going to be attended to is lower uh, than if you don't have any of those vulnerabilities. Uh, at the same time, we also have a culture in which uh, we've prescribed more opioids in this country than any country in the history of the world. Uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, gives uh, prescribes uh, is is one person less than one percent of the world's population, but prescribes thirty percent of world's opioids. Uh, and if those were helpful for patients in the long term, then that would be acceptable. That would be perfectly fine. But what we know is that, especially in the long term, with chronic use for people with chronic pain, uh, many opi uh, the, the opioids actually can lose their effectiveness quite quickly. And many patients with chronic pain, and the best evidence suggests that j simply just taking more opioids can actually increase how much pain people are in. So I think what we need is not less, not more, but right care uh, provided to the right patient at the right time. And that's really what we need to do. It's not just uh, the answer to what we are facing in this country is not just to take away opioids, not just to make sure no one gets opioids or and the, the other is not true as well, where we give everyone opioids. The, the, what we really need to do is make sure that the patients who are most likely to benefit from opioids, the patients who are most likely to experience any type of bias or prejudice, uh, they're the ones that we specially target and make sure that they're getting equitable pain relief. Um, but there's a lot of idiosyncrasies and uh, paradoxes in our health system where we have the resources, we are spending the money, we're just not spending it in the right places. So again, you've, you've helped segue to the next subject that I wanted to bring up. And um, I'm aware of the time, folks, so I will shift to uh, audience questions um, shortly. But in Chapter 7, you really talk about the history of racism in medicine that has resulted today in uh, black and brown Americans suffering more, receiving less adequate pain control at every stage of disease mm -hmm. and at the end of life. And you, you said something that I found provocative, which is that doctors determine who deserves opioid based on their tacit judgment of the patient's character. And that that is mired in subconscious preconceptions. Can you say more about where the preconceptions, where they come from, and any experience you have in trying to flip that script? I think because pain is so subjective, because oftentimes we don't have our usual um, aids, if you may, that can help us make decisions like blood tests or imaging, we have to use our own intuition. We have to look someone in the eye and 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 believe, and believe or, or 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 disbelieve what they're saying about how they're suffering, and so this subjective nature can provide a window for us to connect with our people, patients as human beings. But on the other hand, it can also cause us to revert back to some of our deepest prejudices and biases uh, that are pervasive in society but are affecting all of us. And these biases uh, include but are not restricted to sexism racism, interpersonal and systemic racism. And we see that play out, as you said, Rebecca, uh, for the person in pain throughout their life cycle. It can be, it even, we, there's even evidence to suggest that children, black children who have appendicitis are much less likely to receive pain relief than white children with appendicitis. And then we see this all the way through to the end of life as well. Uh, and part of this is because of pervasive ideas that uh, exist in 
not only our society, but also in our professional circles that were introduced as far back as the time of slavery. One of those ideas is that black people have a higher threshold for pain uh, because they're, they have thicker skin than white people. That's just simply not true. Um, we also have biases against women, uh, against uh, really any type of disadvantage that you have is multiplied when you are in pain because of the subjective nature of pain and because of all the biases and prejudices that exist in our society. So it is a real problem. It is, it is, it is out there. And you know, part of what I've done is I've, I've tried to be more intentional in my own practice about making sure that I am not, I'm not, I'm not acting in a way that is inequitable. Um, I try and uh, model that behavior for my students, for my residents, for my fellows. And then I think certainly that's one of the most important reasons why I wanted to write this book is to actually bring light to many of these uh, areas. I spoke to black patients, black physicians, uh, uh, many of the patients I spoke to in chronic pain were women and females um, so that I can bring their stories forward uh, so that I can sense it. So it's not just about what I can do in my own clinic or my own hospital, but I can have a greater impact and bringing light to all the injustices that patients face when they're in pain. Okay, I promised I would go to some audience questions, so I'm going to do that. Um, <clears throat> the first one is from Terry. What is your opinion of research, recent research about ibuprofen use causing immediate pain relief, but contributing to a high percentage of later chronic pain? Um, so, uh, so there, the ibuprofen is a form of a, is an anti-inflammatory medication, and that can be quite effective for some people with pain. In fact, uh, you know they don't; these medications are not addictive like opioids are, and they don't have that. For some patients, may not have that immediate effect, but for many patients, they can be quite effective. And for many people who have joint pain or back pain, they can be as effective or even more effective than opioids because they don't cause that type of dependence and they don't change how our body processes pain. Uh, you know, having said that, uh, these are individual decisions, all of these medications, even something like ibuprofen and Tylenol come with specific risks. So this is a decision that, you know, everyone should m make with their doctor, but um, I, I, the, the, I did see the research that suggested it, it wasn't well-performed and the best studies don't suggest that uh, that ibuprofen can perpetuate chronic pain. Here's another question. Uh, this is from Joyce. What do you think about spinal cord stimulator? Uh, st spinal cord stimulators are prescribed for people who have back pain. And for some people, they can be effective. They're, they're, they're a very advanced form of therapy. They're, um, they're often a sort of when people have reached a point of no return or if they've had multiple back operations. Uh, you know, to me, um, and, and everyone's different and, and you know, I can't really make a, make a sort of medical recommendation, but for me, the best advice that I got, and again, I consider myself lucky, was that, you know, I went to a surgeon um, when I had my back injury. And, you know, the surgeon was someone who was my teacher and uh, who knew me and so gave me very honest advice that I'll never forget. He said, look, I can operate on you, but your back's never going to be the same. And I think that that is true. I do think that whenever you that for me personally, I think a procedure, any form of procedure should be something that we uh, keep as a last resort, especially when we don't have the sort of evidence that you would expect. Uh, many patients with spinal cord stimulators don't get the relief that they that they hope. Although there are some patients who do, again. Uh, but but my own personal philosophy is to leave these um, as a last resort. Great. Here's a here's another question from Mary. She says, "I would love to see how best we can overcome what has been the devil in the details." with the infiltration of corporate influences. What action steps can we take now as licensed healthcare providers? Yep, I mean, th that's such a great question, Mary. Um, to me, that's been one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to write this book. I think that 
if you look at medicine's response to the opioid epidemic, it's largely been putting the blame on this evil company uh, that kind of came in and caused all this corruption. And now the goal is how can we sue them into the ground? How can we bring all sorts of criminal charges against the company and their family, which is completely fair, but ignores the role that medicine played and allowed itself to be played by these by these by these um, uh, by these corporate actors. In many ways, we haven't learned. We did not learn the lessons from uh, this debacle. If you look at what happened with uh, the new Alzheimer's drug that the FDA approved last year, the story was very very similar to that of OxyContin, where the FDA was kind of, there were members who were having these back channels uh, with this company. They they were given very very. Um, uh, where the, the the evidence was not there, and yet the drug was still approved. Um, I, in many circumstances, in many instances, we have learned, and we are trying to place more how much influence the industry holds on our field. But we, there are so many loopholes. There are so many spheres where uh, where where actors who have money will find ways to influence medicine and medical practice and medical education. I mean, many of the things or many of the lies about medicine that I was taught were taught by some of the best intention teachers in the best medical schools. These were not bad people. And yet we allowed all of our field to be overrun by essentially marketing material that had been developed in these corporate boardrooms. Uh, the way back is going to be through grassroots advocacy. I think, you know, Compassion Choice is a great uh, you know, platform for work like this because it is of patient-centered organization, but it provides a sort of template for what can be done if we all organize and if we go outside of the usual uh, avenues that are presented for change. Uh, I do, th but I do think that physicians and nurses and other clinicians will have to take the lead in this because the establishment has no interest in reducing those sort of form of influences. Um, here's a comment. It's interesting from Sandy. She's uh, talking about a teaching hospital where she's had surgeries. Uh, the philosophy had been to stay ahead of the pain and you'll heal more quickly. Um, but now after the opioid crisis, doctors are cutting back on that, not giving as much strong medication and feels the results are that some surgical patients then are in more pain and that has an effect on their healing. What do you think about that and how do we address it? Yeah, I mean, certainly I think it's true that if, if you know, that, that if we staying ahead of the pain is probably a better idea, but, but I think what's also clear is that doing so with opioids may not be a great idea. Uh, there's a recent work that was published, I want to say last week, I think it was in The Lancet, it was a meta-analysis that showed uh, that, you know, people who had had not law, uh, who had had moderate uh, intensity surgeries in the US who were prescribed opioids end up having more long-term pain if they're given opioids versus those who weren't given opioids. I think uh, mobility is very important after surgery. I think one of the things that we do is we get we leave people in bed and let their bodies get deconditioned. Uh, and I think that that's one of the areas where we can do better. I think thinking of other non-opioid uh, solutions is important. Certainly, I think opioids have a role for acute pain, but I do worry that uh, in the in the in the intermediate or long term, uh, they can do more harm than good. Um, but we are still figuring this out. You know, I think that that's really where we are in medicine. I think that we are still haven't found the right balance between uh, not over treating versus under treating pain. And that's going to be a work that's but but there's a lot of interesting work coming out in this space. And I've been trying to stay up to date on all that material coming out. Uh, do you see a trend with younger physicians being less uh, focused on providing pill medication or surgery and more open to these alternatives? I, that's certainly what I've seen. I think that so many young physicians are coming out and are looking at, you know, part of why I wrote this book as well was because I saw all the, uh, the, the, the devastation that opioids had done. I mean, first of all, and I think you know, so many, you know, opioids never eliminate someone's pain. I'd never seen a meta patient in my life who had been given opioids and who said that, oh, my pain went away and I was able to come off of opioids. Often it is that their pain stays, and but if they come off of opioids, their pain actually gets worse. And so they, they feel they've become trapped in this cycle. Um, and so, and, and so much of our life as trainees uh, in the hospital 
uh, was dominated by giving opioids or negotiating opioids, you know, often at the middle of the night in the emergency room, in the wards, etc. I do think that newer physicians are, are, are more desperate and are more open to providing uh, alternative forms of relief or exploring those options. Um, and they're an important group that I'm trying to reach through this work as well um, to influence them and, and to shape their practice. So Bruce is asking a question. I'm going to kind of summarize it a little bit differently, but he's wondering about um, any sort of data on statistics about who receives opioids and how much so that we can look at trends in, in gender or race. Uh, do we know any data on yeah. prescribing patterns? Yeah, there is tons of data in this space. I mean, I think so. So for 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 racial and ethnic break, breakdown, it's very clear that uh, people of color are less likely to receive opioids, um, whether that's uh, in the acute setting or whether that's in the chronic setting. Both those are true. Uh, when it comes to uh, sex based or gender based differences, there is actually interesting where uh, women are actually more likely that women are more likely in general to have chronic pain. They're more likely to have uh, pain conditions that are associated with chronic pain, such as osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or other conditions such as fibromyalgia or um, CPRS. Uh, they're also more likely to be given opioids at, at for longer durations and higher doses as well. Uh, so, so that so I I think I think the dif the disparity is very very clear when it comes to racial and ethnic minorities. It's actually less clear how women's treat uh, pain is treated. What we do know is that many women's pain is underrecognized. Many women have had experiences in which diagnoses have been delayed because physicians refuse to believe that they were in pain. Um, uh, you know, one of the biggest risk factors for um, addiction to opioids is having some type of comorbid psychiatric conditions such as anxiety or depression because you know one of the things that opioids are very very effective at especially in the acute setting is actually making people feel better because you know the op opioids mimic this internal system inside all of us that causes us to have joy or to feel love and to feel socially connected uh, and but what what opioids do is that they make us entirely dependent on those pills to be able to replicate those experiences afterwards so yes, we know a lot about uh, prescription patterns uh, for opioids uh, in general, um, and uh, there's a lot. And, and I think how we use that data to change practice is still kind of ongoing. I'm going to put these last few questions, comments together. Um, people are asking about physical therapy to control pain, mm -hmm. mindfulness, and meditation. And I think the the bigger question is how much control do we have over our suffering and our pain? Well, um, I, I think, um, you know, I, 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 this, is, this is not a self-help. I, I, I don't believe in self-help books. I think I don't, I don't want to sort of feel like I'm the purveyor of some special knowledge that I, I, uh, and, and that somehow we can just, you know, you know, pull ourselves up from the brute death and overcome all sorts of suffering. But, I do think, and there's a lot of evidence that suggests that the human body has this great well and this great depth for being able to heal itself from pain and suffering. Uh, I, I know this because, you know, like I was mentioning in the last response, our body has this very rich network of internal opioids that we make ourselves to provide us not just relief, but also joy and social connectedness. And uh, an example of just how profound of an ability we have to Find relief is in fact seen in uh, the placebo effect. So you know, the so placebo effect is essentially when we anticipate that something is going to make us feel better. That anticipation, that hope, can have a very, very powerful, demonstrable effect in how well we do. And oftentimes, the placebo effect is enhanced by by kindness, by empathy. So if you're a physician or if you're a clinician, and if you want to know. How can I be a better pain physician today? How can I take, how can, what is the one thing I can do today um, that can make me more effective at helping people in pain? It is to be more empathetic and to be kinder because that is going to enhance people's own ability to overcome pain. 
the other thing is that's one of the reasons why physical therapy can be very very effective is that again even though it can hurt in the start in the long term physical therapy can be very effective and part of that is because when we exercise our body secretes its own endorphins and its own sort of opioids that can help overcome these aches and pains that we face often on a daily basis and then the role for meditation and and, and mindfulness is also extremely important again i think one of the things that we need in general any philosophy or any process that distracts us from the pain that takes our attention away from the pain and focuses more on living our life to the fullest is going to be effective uh, for most people so i think that there's a pro there's promise and there's evidence to suggest that all of these forms of interventions work uh, which one is going to work for the individual person uh, there might be differences and in fact there are differences which is why i think uh, having an open mind uh, being hopeful uh, is is so important uh, for the person and uh, for the pain and also their caregivers as well. So um, I know we're coming to the top of the hour. So what I'd like to do is give what I'm considering to be bonus content. Um, somebody in the chat mentioned your earlier book header, Modern Death, which I just happen to have right here. Um, this is a few years ago that it was written, How Medicine Changed the End of Life. And one of the parts of this book that I really like um, is when you talk about, you quote Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And her quote is, dying nowadays is more gruesome in many ways, namely more lonely, mechanical, and dehumanized. At times, it is even difficult to determine technically when the time of death has occurred. And she wrote that in 1969. Mm -hmm. So how would you, this is just bonus for folks and they, it's a teaser to go out and um, get modern death. How would you sum up why Americans are so fearful of and reluctant to talk about death? Well, part of why we're so fearful of death is because death has been so medicalized that you know death is gonna be for any living organism, especially for a human being, for us, it's gonna be the most scary thing and the most existentially anxiety inducing phenomenon that we'll ever experience in our life. Now, if, if on top of that, you make it something that is very alien, that is very medicalized, that is very mechanical, and you take away the human aspects of that experience, you're going to make it even more scary because now not only is it causing you existential distress, but it's in an unfamiliar cold environment. And many of the issues that cause us that have caused us to be so bad at taking care of the person in pain is all are also the reason why we're so bad at taking care, care of people at the end of life. And so really modern death, this book was 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 inspired by my own experiences of seeing people at the end of life who were suffering, who didn't feel like they knew what was going on, and who just wanted some semblance of understanding, who wanted a hand, who wanted some knowledge. Uh, and so this is so that, that was my first uh, nonfiction book and the, the goal was for people to feel like they had a map that they were empowered in some way when they reached or their loved one reached that moment. Uh, and I, I think that doctors also fear death and are reluctant to talk about it. How does that fac factor into how medicine is able to help people at the end of life? Yeah, I mean, we, we're so focused, uh, we, you know, in medical school, we're taught that death is the enemy. And yet, if that is the case, then why do we always lose? Because death is going to come upon all of us. I think what we need is a change in approach. I think it is, it, it is suffering and needless suffering that is the enemy, not death per se. And I think that as, as physicians become more, and, and physicians shouldn't feel like just because someone is at the end of life that they cannot do anything for the patient anymore, that they cannot help the patient anymore. In fact, that might be when they assume their most important role, because that is when a patient needs their physician more than at any other moment. Um, and I think we've, we've created a health system and we've created, created these medical curricula that are fo so focused on treating illness as a mystery to be solved. And when there's no mystery to be solved, then we're not as interested in it anymore. Uh, and I think that's the other thing that we need to overcome is to make sure that we're, it is not just about, we don't treat people like there's some type of multiple choice question, but as human beings whose stories are important, whose stories need to be heard and retold in ways that centered them rather than the needs of our health system. 
uh, and our own personal desires. So I do think that physicians are afraid of talking about debt. I think they've just never, it's been, uh, but, but, I might, but again, I look to the younger generation and I see, and I am very hopeful. Uh, so uh, nowadays people are getting much better education about palliative care, about hospice, about end of life care, about advanced care planning than any of the older physicians or older generations ever did. And that's why I'm hopeful that these things are going to change for the better. Well, Heather, you're so articulate. <laughs> I love talking to you. Thank you for, especially because I got to ask all the good questions or the hard questions um, that I enjoyed about the book. I really appreciate that. Can you let folks know again, where can they get um, either the Song of Our Scars or Modern Death? Are those available on Amazon? <clears throat> They're available on all uh, platforms that you prefer. They're available at Barnes and Nobles. They're available on Amazon. They're available on bookshot.com, on Goodreads, in your local libraries. You can always check your independent bookstores. Uh, both of those books should be widely available uh, for anyone who, who, who uh, is interested. I'm going to shift real quickly before I say my final goodbyes to share with you all the next book. Um, so in July, actually Tuesday, July 19th, we're going to be welcoming Dr. Martha Callahan, and her book is called A Death Lived. Um, you can go to our website, compassionatechoices.org slash events to, to register for that. <clears throat> it's, it's Martha's story, the journey of her husband. Um, his final illness and death, and how she came at this as a doctor, and how, how much of her perspective was informed and shifted when it became a personal experience with her husband, um, and what she learned asking big questions about the dying process and the spirituality of that. So I think it's going to be very interesting, and our new medical director, Dr. Susan Wilhoyt, is going to be interviewing Dr. Callahan. Callahan. So please join us for that. And before I go, I remind everybody that everything we do at Compassion and Choices is supported by donations from people like you. Please give if you can and join me in thanking Heather Vareich uh, for being with us tonight. Thank you so much. And um, buy the book and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. For time. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Compassion and Choices, uh, for all the great work that you're doing. It's a pleasure to be associated with this wonderful organization. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you.